Yeah. All right, yeah, it's a great pleasure to be with you tonight. Um, I grew up with uh, Dr. Micah Green, uh, who many of you know. Uh, we were in high school together, played a lot of basketball together, too much basketball together. Um, and he got me connected with Rocio Christi here. So my path was philosophy major at some school down the road that we don't need to mention. Um, then a couple years at Oxford uh, doing a philosophical theology master's uh, with Brian Leftow. And then uh, too many years, the more years I want to count at Notre Dame doing a PhD in philosophy, uh, focused in philosophy of religion. And uh, I've yeah, taught philosophy for several years and then made the jump into uh, finance. And I, yeah, I'm a financial planner, financial advisor now. Uh, moved back to Texas to be with family. Um, and not just Dr. Green, but also my parents, my brother, sister, they're all here. So we're very happy to be back in College Station. Uh, and I've warmed up to the place uh, a great deal since my undergrad days. And I'm uh, just, yeah, very happy to be here. And, very happy to be talking a philosophy, uh, talking philosophy of religion with you people tonight. I wanted to start by um, getting a little bit of a sense from you of like uh, some some demographics. So um, first of all, um, so how many undergraduates do we have? Okay, we're mostly undergraduate graduate students. Okay, we got a few graduate students. Awesome. Okay, professors, staff. Any other types? Okay, I've, others that I've left out. All right, yeah. So good to good to get a sense of kind of uh, uh, any philosophy majors. Okay, we got we got the lone philosophy major minors, philosophy minors. Okay, so the philosophy major and minor can help others to maybe track things a little bit. Um, but I'm going to try to break this down as much as possible. So a couple of a uh, couple of things in the title, right? So does skeptical theism undermine natural theology. So let's just start with, uh, with those two terms. Okay. Um, skeptical theism. So let me just ask, how many of you have heard this term, skeptical theism? Oh, good. All right. Um, Where did you hear this term? Was this in a session of Ratio Christi or some other place? Here? Here? Good. Oh, well, well done, Zachary. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, so skeptical theism. Uh, I'll give a little bit more precise a definition uh, in, in a moment, but uh, the basic idea of skeptical theism is it's okay to say, I don't know why God allows evils in the world. It's okay, right? This is kind of a movement in late 20th century philosophy where philosophers started defending in pretty sophisticated ways the claim that it's okay. It's okay to say, I don't know. Uh, Maybe theists have said it, um, perhaps, depending on how you interpret it, at least since Job, right, uh, uh, says, uh, where were you when I laid the foundations of the world? Kind of a non-answer, not very satisfying philosophically, maybe. And philosophers started in sophisticated ways defending the claim that that's okay, that's okay, that we don't have an answer, we're not going to give an answer. Um, which is kind of interesting, right, because in a lot of different domains, including philosophy, including philosophy of religion, a lot of different domains, the answer, I don't know, means you lose, right? Um, we've just finished with an election cycle. Well, we're almost finished. Uh, some votes being counted still. But we're finished with election cycle. In, in an election season, you see, uh, you see interviews and debates, and if uh, a, a politician is put on the spot and, and uh, asked, a question, asked a, a, a gotcha question, and they just say, I don't know, well, they lose, right? That's, that's, a, that, that's, that's game over, right, when you say, I lose. Um, and in debates over philosophy of religion, in debates over apologetics, that seems to be a, a, a white flag when you just say, I don't know, right? Uh, imagine William Lane Craig debating with, I don't know, Richard Dawkins, and, uh, and he presses Richard Dawkins, like, okay, well, what do you think happened to the body of Jesus after the crucifixion, after it was, uh, after it was put in, in, in the grave? What do you think happened? Uh, do, you think, um, do you think the body was snatched? Do you think maybe Jesus uh, wasn't, wasn't really dead, got up and walked away, gives him several possibilities, and Richard Dawkins just says, I don't know. Well, probably most people watching the debate would say, well, game over. Dr. Craig wins. Okay, so I don't know is usually a game over. The skeptical theist says, no, it's not a game over, and I'll give you reasons why it's not a game over. Okay, so, so that's, that's the skeptical theist, the basic skeptical theist uh, approach to the problem of evil. I'm talking about problem of evil like we all know 
what I'm talking about. Um, but uh, I don't know, could, could someone give us like a basic definition of the, the so-called problem of evil? How would you, how would you articulate it? So says, what's the problem of evil? Okay, yeah, the existence of evil and suffering seem to be at least in tension with the existence of a God of the usual description, um, if not outright contradiction, right, with the idea of such a God. Okay, so there seems to be some, some sort of a problem. A problem for who? A problem for the theist, right? A problem for anyone defending the idea that God, a God of that description exists, right? So that, that's, that's a problem, a problem of evil. And the skeptical theist says... Uh, we, we can just say, I don't know, I don't know why it, it, it exists, and that's not, um, we can dissolve the problem in that way. Um, okay, other term, natural theology. Okay, so natural theology is uh, a, a lot of what uh, you all do here in Ratio Christi. Uh, it's considering, studying arguments for the existence of God, where the premises, right, the reasons that are given for the conclusions, those premises are deliverances of natural reason. They are things that are available to everyone. You don't open up a religious scripture and pull premises out of that religious scripture. Uh, you, you, you use reason, maybe you use science. Uh, so maybe it's just the immediate testimony of the senses. Maybe it's something that's, that is arrived at uh, by doing some science with the empirical evidence that you receive. But in any case, you start there and then you argue from there to the existence of God, right? That's, that's natural theology. Um, and it could be to the existence of God, and then from there you might argue to the attributes of God. Um, what is God like? What sort of being is God? And what is God not? Uh, what's true and what's not true of God, okay? Um, okay, so the, the question for this talk is, does skeptical theism undermine natural theology? Uh, well, why think it would? That doesn't, they don't, that seems like a strange thing to say. Skeptical theism is a way of undermining arguments against God's existence, right? So you have this problem of evil, this argument from evil. Look, there are horrendous, terrible evils in the world, many, many, and, uh, and, and of great intensity, uh, of great duration. That's incompatible with God's existence, or at least in tension with God's existence, right? So that's, that's what skeptical theism is aimed at. Um, so th why would anyone think that it's, uh, it's, it's now in tension with natural theology? Okay, so that's, that's what this is about. Uh, the handout that I've given you is, is meant to help you kind of track the, the conversation, the dialectic as we call it. So there's, there's been a back and forth within the literature and my paper is positioned in response to uh, some of the moves that, are, that have been made in that, in that literature. Um, okay, so the, the natural theologian is the person offering, advancing arguments for God's existence on the basis of natural reason. The natural a theologian is the person using the same sorts of stuff, the same sorts of evidence to argue against God's existence. Okay, so that's the natural a theologian, a theologian like atheist. Um, okay. So natural a theologian argues, look, there are pointless, gratuitous evils in the world, okay? So gratuitous meaning there is no greater good that comes out of this. There's no compelling justification for God to allow this particular evil. Uh, so now why, why is the, the argument put in this, in this way, this pr first premise? Why is, he, why is it put in this way? Um, well, because if you just take a simple, flat-footed argument against the existence of God from evil, if you say, if, um, if God exists, then no evil, evil, therefore no God, God doesn't exist, the squiggly, maybe you've seen that some places, a squiggly, uh, this tilde is sometimes used as a not, a not symbol, okay? Um, all right, so there's a flat-footed argument against God's existence. If God, then no evil. Evil, therefore, no God, right? Like easy modus tollens argument. Um, doesn't, it's not very plausible, right? Because there's, there's no reason to think that God would not allow there to be any evil in the world. Uh, we have plenty of experience with good people allowing bad things to happen. That can happen in a number of, uh, number of ways. For example, uh, 
if the, if the good thing that uh, is allowed to happen is for the sake of something, something better, something greater. Uh, my, I, I um, allow my, my son to, my son didn't pack his lunch and I had told him to pack his lunch and I let him go to school without lunch, right? Um, it's a bad thing that he's hungry at lunch. I let that happen, why? So that he learns responsibility, learns to make his own lunch and take care of things like this, okay. Uh, it's a bad thing, but it's, it's worth it, right? Uh, for a greater good. Okay, so that's not very plausible. If God exists, there would be no evil at all in the world. Okay, but this is plausible. If God existed, there would be no gratuitous evil, no pointless evil, no evil such that there's, there's no greater good that it is served by this evil. There's no compelling reason, no justification for this evil. God wouldn't do that. God wouldn't allow that to happen. That's a much more plausible thesis and therefore gives you a much uh, more plausible argument for God's existence. Okay, so if God exists, there's no gratuitous evil, there's gratuitous evil, therefore it's not the case, it's not the case that God exists. All right, so what we've done is we've weakened the first premise, we logically weakened, that's not to say it's less plausible, in fact it's more plausible, but it's logically weaker, it's easier for it to be true. But in order to then get the conclusion, we have to logically strengthen the second premise to still get the conclusion. So what we're doing now is we're making a stronger claim. We're not just claiming there is evil in the world, we're making the much bolder, much firmer claim that there is gratuitous evil in the world. There is evil out there that has no point, or at least if there is a point, it's insufficient. It's not good enough to justify. Uh, you'll sometimes encounter this in arguments uh, between Christians and, uh, and atheists or other theists and atheists, uh, where the atheist raises a, points to a particular evil and says, look, there's this horrible thing. Why does this happen? And the Christian gives some, some weak answer, uh, like, uh, well, yeah, I know, I know the Holocaust happened, um, but, you know, um, you know, people learn some valuable life lessons out of it. Oh, that's none, no, weak sauce, come on, do better, right? Valuable life lessons out of the Holocaust. Don't, you, yeah, you're kind of missing the, the proportion, the, you know, the gravity of the situation, right? Okay, so um, with, yeah, when we're talking about gratuitous evils, we're not just, we're not just talking about uh, that the evil Every evil must have a point. It's got to have a sufficient point. It's got to have a sufficient good that it serves or some greater evil that, that it is avoiding. Okay? So, but nevertheless, this is a bolder claim that there are gratuitous, there are gratuitous evils out there. Um, okay, so the skeptical, this is where the skeptical theist enters. Skeptical theists, they enter at this point and they say, all right, you're making this logically stronger claim. There are gratuitous evils in the world. What makes you think that? Uh, the only reason that you have to think that there are gratuitous evils is you look around, you point to yeah, the most, most horrible evils that you can identify. You look at them and you say, well, what could possibly justify this? I can't see anything that could justify this, this evil, right? Learning life lessons um, for something as horrible as the Holocaust, right? That, that doesn't justify it, okay? Um, what, what else can, can we come up with? Um, I, I, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, gaining more self-understanding. Um, you know, being more interested in building community. Okay, these are all good things, yeah. But none of them really seems to justify something so horrible, right? Uh, so the skeptical theist says essentially what you're doing is you're, you're creating a list of possible things that could justify this horrible evil. You're finding all of them unsatisfying. You're finding all of them inadequate. And then you're concluding that there is no justification for this horrendous, horrible evil, okay? So you're, you're, you're doing basically an enumerative induction. You're looking at a, a set of instances. Here's a, here's a possible justification. Here's a possible, here's a possible, here's a possible. None of them are any good. So there are no, just, there is no good justification. There's no sufficient justification for this evil that's happening, okay? That's the move that you, the a theologian, are making, and the skeptical theist says, no good. This is no good, this, this inference is no good, right? Uh, you look at a few instances and you say they're not justified, they're not sufficient, and then you conclude that 
there just is no sufficient justification, okay? Uh, so this, now why would the skeptical theists say that? Why would they say that's, that inference is no good? Uh, well, they say the inference is no good because it's a kind of, uh, kind of argument, maybe you'll use this term when you talked about skeptical theism before, it's a, it's a no seum inference, right? Uh, a no seum refers to a, uh, a midge, a biting insect, a little tiny biting insect, right? Uh, so, uh, like, look around the room, okay, quickly, right? How many midges, how many, how many biting insects, little tiny biting insects do you see? I submit we see zero, right? We see no, no seums, okay? We see none of these little midges in this room, okay? How many midges are there? How many tiny biting insects are there in this room? Or, you know, you say maybe it's the wrong season. Okay, how many, how many like eggs, right? How many tiny insect eggs are there in this room, in the carpet somewhere? Well, I don't see any. Okay, does that mean there aren't any? No, no. That's a bad inference, right? Because if they were there, if there were tiny insect eggs somewhere in the carpet in this room, I wouldn't see them. So the fact that I don't see them is neither here nor there. It gives me really no evidence that there are no no seums or no seum eggs over in this room. It is, it's not a good inference, okay? It's a no seum inference. The skeptical theist says that's exactly the position we're in with respect to this claim that there are gratuitous evils. You look at a few possible justifications that, you know, um, a 12-year-old could have come up with in five minutes for the Holocaust, and you say, oh, they're no good. And then you conclude, there's no possible justification out there for this horrendous evil. Uh, well, that's a little too quick um, for a lot of reasons, among which is that we're stupid humans, right? We have, in, not, not us specifically in this room, but like as a, as a species, we're just kind of dumb. We've got this, you know, a uh, three, four pound piece of meat between our ears, that's all we got to work with. I mean, we do pretty impressive things with that, but uh, the angels are looking at us and, and just like, oh, that, yeah, that's, they're, 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 not, they're not very impressed, okay? Um, so, yeah, we, we, don't have, uh, we don't have the sort of equipment that we would need to see the justifications if they are perhaps very complex, if they are very abstract, if they involve things that we are just uh, unable to access by our senses uh, or, or by our intuitive or ratiocinative, our, our reasoning faculties. Uh, we've, we've, um, so, so that puts us really in no position to, 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 to suggest that the, the handful of possible justifications we've come up with for evils is representative of the possible justifications that are out there. So the skeptical theist says this, this uh, this way, the way that we support this premise that there are gratuitous evils, it's no good. Okay, so um, we, we can um, either reject or at least we can't assert this second premise and then, and therefore this argument against God's existence, it's, it really doesn't get anywhere. Um, it's really by, it's a by no means compelling argument um, against God's existence. Um, okay, uh, score, score a point for the, the theist, for the theologian, score, take a point away from the atheologian. All right, next, okay, next step, uh, next step in the, in the dialectic. So the next step in the dialectic um, is a philosopher named John Bowden who says, hold on, hold on, careful there, uh, you, you um, apologist, you theologians, natural theologians, um, hold on, you are being skeptical about our ability to grasp, to identify potential justifications for, uh, for a particular evil that happens. You're exercising this skepticism, but you would really, you're, you're trying to be selective about your skepticism. You're trying to say, this we don't know. This we're unable to say anything about because we're stupid humans, three pound piece of meat between our ears and so on, okay? Um, but careful, skepticism tends to be a universal acid. Tends to be a universal acid. Ask Descartes. He tries to limit his skepticism so that he can 
uh, demolish the foundations of science and build up a new science on its basis. But uh, most readers of Descartes come away thinking he really didn't get very far. He did not get us out of, out of the matrix. Uh, we're perhaps still in the matrix as far as Descartes' arguments are concerned. Didn't get us very far. Uh, at best, what Descartes maybe established is I exist and I have various uh, sensations, experiences. He probably did not uh, succeed in establishing that there's a podium right here or that there are other people in the room. His project, um, it's most, almost universally agreed the project failed at that, uh, at that next step, even to an external world. Okay, miserable failure. Uh, didn't get anywhere near a science, okay, which was his ultimate project. So skepticism tends to be a universal acid. And, uh, and in particular, Bowdoin says, watch out. This acid that you're applying to the argument against God's existence from evil, that acid you're applying there may also dissolve your arguments from natural theology, your arguments for God's existence. For concreteness, I'll focus on uh, what's called the fine-tuning argument. Okay? Um, have you all covered the fine-tuning argument uh, at some point in, in Ratio Christi? Okay. So uh, can someone give us a quick and dirty version of the, like, I mean, you could, you could give a, to really explain the fine-tuning argument, it takes a good, like, 10 to 20 minutes, but can someone give us, like, a quick and dirty version of the fine-tuning argument? Yes? I think it's when there's, a, there's all these constants that make up the universe. Yep. And if any of those constants were just, like, the tiniest, tiniest bit mm -hmm. difference, yep. the universe would entirely change. Right. Okay, Planck's constant, gravitational constant, cosmological constant. There's, uh, and depending on which physicist and which theor uh, you know, theory that they're they're looking at, which which way of constructing the cosmology, it's going to be a different set. Uh, Sir Martin Rees has his book, just six numbers, but in different theories, it's two numbers or it's twelve numbers, right? But in any case, uh, various uh, physicists have, have they build models of cosmology of how the universe is developed. And there are these constants that, are, uh, that, that govern the development of the, the cosmos uh, in all of these models. And the really interesting thing that they found is that if you, if you tweak those constants in your computer simulation just very, very slightly, just a fraction of a percentage in either direction, up or down, then the whole thing falls apart. Instead of a nice, smooth, big bang, you get maybe a big crunch where uh, there's a bang and then immediately it just falls back in on itself and nothing interesting ever happens. Uh, or you get a big fizzle where uh, you, you get a, an uninteresting universe that it does spread out, but nothing, I like to use the word congeals, that's not a physicist's word, but uh, nothing congeals and you don't get like stars and planets, maybe even, not even heavier elements perhaps. Um, so you don't get an interesting universe. So the, the constants that govern uh, the development of the cosmos, they seem to be very carefully fine-tuned. Uh, so their existence within this range is called, is often called fine-tuning. Uh, and that's often been uh, presented as evidence for the existence of God. And, and a way to, the way to present this, I'm going to use something, uh, this, you'll see this at the bottom of your handout, and use something called the Bayes box. Um, okay, so the Bayes box is a way of thinking, that's, that's a, that's, not, not a very good box. It, it looked good from my angle, but I can see it's not very good from yours. Um, all right. Try to draw somewhat parallel lines. Okay. Um, okay, so, so the Bayes box, um, what, we, what we do is we, we take our hypothesis, in this case, that God exists, right? And on the left side is the hypothesis that God exists. On the right side is the hypothesis that God doesn't exist. And we have to, by magic, assign a prior probability. Uh, and I say by magic because it's actually uh, hotly debated how exactly we're to assign a prior probability in the first place. Um, very, very interesting, difficult question. Uh, start with reading Richard Swinburne's work on, uh, on, on Bayesian uh, arguments for God's existence to, 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 uh, to get at this. Uh, but the, the literature is quite extensive on uh, how do you get at a good prior probability? But just for fun, um, let's just choose kind of a default. Let's say it's like 50-50 prior probability, okay? Uh, so if I had no evidence at all, then I would just say maybe God exists, maybe God doesn't. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll bet as much on it as against it. You know, I'll take either side of the bet. Um, 
before I have any evidence, and then you have to give me evidence to push me off of the 50-50, right? Uh, you could give arguments to, to the conclusion that maybe it shouldn't be 50-50, maybe it should be more like 90-10 or something like that, but uh, in any case, um, you gotta assign some kind of prior probability, and we, we represent that along the x-axis of the Bayes box. Okay, um, and then in the Bayes box, you then represent um, your, uh, uh, your evidence, okay? And so the way, the way we do this is on the left-hand side, we put a probability symbol, a P or a PR, depending on which notation you're using. So use probability of, okay, the, the way we read this is probability of fine-tuning given, that vertical bar says given, given that God exists, okay? How likely is it, if God existed, how likely is it that we would see fine-tuning in the universe, okay? How likely is it, um, so I was, um, I was looking for the room before I came in here. I was looking for the room, okay? Oh, that, that looks like it could be the room. Oh, there are students in there. There are students in there. That suggests to me that this is the right room, that we're actually having a meeting in this room, okay? Given that this is the right room, uh, given that this is the right room, it's is very probable that there will be students in there uh, five minutes before meeting time, okay? Um, so so that's, that's how we read this probability of this fact given this, that the, the truth of this hypothesis, okay? Um, and then on the opposite side, we do probability of that fact occurring, this phenomenon occurring given that the hypothesis is given the opposite hypothesis, given that it's not true. Okay. All right, so, um, and then we, we adjust each of these up or down depending on, uh, depending on the, uh, whatever the case of the matter is, uh, whatever the probability we think might be, what our estimate is. So um, in the case of fine tuning, we think that, well, if God existed, we have every, every reason to expect a fine-tuning, a fine-tuned universe. God would be able to do that. God would have reason to do that, to create a universe that's fine-tuned, that's capable of sustaining life. So we should, we should you know, put, put this fairly high, um, somewhere maybe not 100%, but, but very, very likely that if God existed, that God would create uh, an amazing, intricate universe that is fine-tuned in such a way that there can be complex uh, uh, systems and complex organisms. Um, what if God didn't exist? Well, this is kind of the point of the fine-tuning argument that uh, those, the, the, those constants, um, there are all manner of different values that they could have. They don't have to have exactly the value you find in your physics or your chemistry textbook. Uh, we could imagine all kinds of other values. Uh, and if it's sheer coincidence that they have those values, that's extremely improbable just by chance that they would have the particular values that they have and that they need to have in order to sustain a universe like this. Okay, so this probability, like without God existing, that the constants would be right where they need to be, uh, that is arguably extremely low. Okay, that's how the fine-tuning argue, fine -tuning argument works. Okay, so um, the way that you then evaluate this is you look at, um, oh, they've helpfully provided another color. Okay, so we helpfully look, we look at this figure here, okay, look at this figure, and we look and see how much of the God hypothesis occupies that whole figure, or what percentage of the whole figure, rather, is occupied by the God hypothesis. In this case, the majority of it, the vast majority of this L-shaped figure is occupied by the God hypothesis, okay? So what this means is very likely very likely, based on this evidence, very likely God exists. Um, whereas, if you could just as easily get fine-tuning without God existing, if, if this was our box, or if it was even more likely, like if, uh, if you were more likely to have fine-tuning if God didn't exist, then, then that would be your figure. Okay, and the God, hypo God hypothesis would occupy the minority. Um, a smaller share of that space, and so we would say mm, that that uh, that fact doesn't actually support the claim that God exists. Okay, so this is how the Bayes box works, and it illustrates a theorem called Bayes' theorem. Um, but I won't, yeah, I won't really go into the theorem tonight. We can just operate with the Bayes box. Um, okay, so here's what Bowden uh, says to uh, the skeptical theist. Uh, Bowden says. 
look, you're going to undermine natural theology. And the way, the way in which you're going to undermine natural theology with your skeptical theism is, is this, that, okay, um, when someone are, uh, offers a fine-tuning argument, they're saying, look, um, if God existed, we would expect to see a fine-tuned universe. But Bowdoin says, well, suppose I mimic the skeptical theist, and I say, ah, oh, yes, um, God would do that. God would create a beautiful, orderly universe, a wonderful universe where there can exist free creatures with meaningful relationships, meaningful lives. God would do that. Unless, of course, there was some compelling reason for God not to do it. Now, that might catch a skeptical theist off guard a little bit and say, well, what reason could God possibly have not to do that? That's a, that's a, a wonderful thing for God to do, to create this beautiful, amazing, fine-tuned universe. What reason could God possibly have that would be compelling not to do that? And here the natural atheologian can just say, I don't know. I don't know what reason God could possibly have not to do that. I don't know. But so what? You skeptical theist, when we say, look, look at this horrible evil, uh, we can't, what, why would God allow something like that? You skeptical theist, you say, you say to us, I don't know. You say, I don't know, and that's okay. I don't know. God could have one, and we're stupid humans, and we have just, we don't have the equipment to, to come up with the reason, but that doesn't mean it isn't there. There could be a reason why God allows this evil. Now, I, the skeptical, uh, the, the skeptical atheologian, can respond to your fine-tuning argument in precisely the same way. I could say, uh, yes, God would create a beautiful universe unless, for some reason that we cannot fathom because we're stupid humans, there's some compelling reason for God not to do that. Okay, so Bowden's point is, if you take this tack in response to the problem of evil, if you say, ah, we're stupid humans, there may be some good justification, some good reason for God to allow the evil. Well, then, we can turn the tables. And to the fine-tuning argument, we can say, um, yes, God would create something like this unless, for some reason we can't fathom, God has a compelling reason not to. God has a compelling reason not to create a beautiful, orderly universe. So Bowden's point is, now these seem to be on a par with each other. So your skeptical theism is proving to be a universal acid. Yes, maybe it does dissolve the argument from evil against God's existence, but it also dissolves the argument for God's existence from fine-tuning and other such arguments for similar reasons. You see how that works, right? You see the, the, the problem that Bowdoin has raised, that uh, we can the, the, the natural atheologian can pull a jujitsu move and use the force of the skeptical theist argument against him. Okay. Um, and, uh, yes? Can you say briefly how, how the same principle applies to other arguments for questions? For other arguments? Um, so the, the philosopher I'm going to move to is Ted Poston in a moment. And this works, this works for a posteriori arguments. Okay, that is arguments from, uh, like, so natural theological arguments. Not going to work uh, against, like, a, an ontological argument where you're using a priori principles, okay? Uh, it's not going to work there. So you'd have to have, uh, the atheologian will have to have a different critique of those sorts of arguments. But any sort of argument that relies on saying that God would do this or God would do that to say, to, to look at certain evidence in the, in the universe, maybe it's, the existence of free creatures. Maybe it's the existence of, uh, uh, of, 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 a, of a, a scripture or religion with wise teachings. Uh, the, the existence of this suggests that God exists. Anything where you're saying this is evidence for God's existence, rather than saying we have this principle maybe of causation, maybe of, of necessity, uh, and that, that is our reason for, for showing that God exists. So it's widespread, but it's not, it doesn't apply to all arguments uh, for God's existence. Um, okay, so um, so yeah, like personally I wrestled with this for a while. I didn't know about, I didn't know Bowdoin had published a paper saying exactly this, but I like personally was, was very worried for several years in graduate school about, uh, about this issue. 
Um, and then only a few years ago, it, uh, when I like, really started digging into the, the, the arguments themselves and trying to understand them, uh, then, then yeah, I felt like I made uh, a bit of progress. Um, and then discovered Ted Poston. I'm actually going to skip over just for the sake of time to allow plenty, plenty of time for questions. I'll skip over Ted Poston. Um, essentially what happens is Ted Poston says, uh, he, he says, no, 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 we can, we can salvage... We can salvage skeptical theism without giving up natural theology. We can do that. And he makes an attempt at doing it. And if you look carefully at his attempt at doing it, it doesn't work, right? Um, so we'll skip over that um, because, I mean, you might find that a little bit pointless, maybe even gratuitous, you might say, uh, to, to do that because he tries it. It doesn't work. Okay. So here's what I think does work. Uh, what I think does work is if we look a little more carefully at the situation of compare the the argument from evil. Let me let me put the other Bayes box uh, up there now. Yeah, you've got it on your handout, but I want to be able to point to it. Okay, so there's our fine tuning, uh, our fine tuning Bayes box. Let me put the Bayes box for. Ooh, that's uh, it's getting worse, not better. <laughs> All right. Um, so God, not God. All right. In this case, the claim is evil, okay, given probability of evil exists, given God exists, probability of evil given not God exists. Okay. Um, okay, so what I've got up on the board over here is something that comes from Michael Tooley. Um, so Michael Tooley is um, an, an A theologian, a natural A theologian. Um, and, and what Tuli does is he says, look, um, if you look at the, if you think about the, the problem of evil, the argument from evil, take a, a concrete case, take the, the Lisbon earthquake that like the early modern philosophers all were wringing their hands about, okay? This, earth, this terrible earthquake in Lisbon that caused so much death, injury, destruction, okay? It's, it's, it's a, clearly a very horrible evil, um, uh, very hard to explain. Uh, maybe impossible for us, stupid humans, to explain why God would allow this terrible evil to occur. All right. Um, so the situation there, Tuli says, is we know, we know some reasons why this is bad. Okay, we know some reasons. And um, this this picture here is so uh, for those in the math and sciences, you can you can um, call it, you can put a name on it, you can say it's um, it's we're doing we're doing vector addition. Uh, on a one-dimensional space, okay? So you've got this one-dimensional line, uh, and good is in this direction, bad is in this direction. And God would only do something, God would only bring something about or allow something to happen um, if, the, if at least the good outweighs the bad, right? The reasons for it <clears throat> outweigh the reasons against it. But in the case of the Lisbon earthquake, we've got some really strong reasons that we can easily identify. Even a child can identify some really strong reasons not to allow that to happen, okay, because of all the terrible uh, the consequences of the Lisbon earthquake. Okay, so, um, yeah, the usual thing with vector addition. So you have, you have your arrows representing the various reasons, okay, the reasons not to allow this. And then um, I use one big arrow to represent what we'll call the, the resultant, okay, the resultant of the conceivable, the, the conceivable uh, uh, reasons, reasons we can conceive of not to let this happen, okay? So, um, so we'll call it the conceivable resultant. The conceivable resultant is, it, it's, it's got a, quite a bit of length in this direction, okay? In the direction of, no, don't allow this, prevent this, okay? So, so we got that. Um, now, something that Poston had suggested, which unfortunately Thule had already suggested, but uh, put to other use, um, is that, okay, there may be, right, there, there may be, um, uh, of course, as the skeptical theist will say, there may be reasons we can't conceive of to allow this terrible thing to happen, the Lisbon earthquake, right? Okay, so there may be unconceived and maybe even inconceivable reasons to allow it to happen. Uh, there may be several of them, and they may, may add up. Their resultant may be large, except that, of course, there may also be further unconceived, maybe even inconceivable reasons not to allow it to happen, right? So the skeptical theist likes to point to 
likes to point to uh, unconceived, inconceivable reasons for allowing this bad thing to happen. But Thule says, remember, there could also be inconceivable reasons against it as well. And maybe those just wash out, right? Um, so what, what Thule does is he breaks it down into four, po four basic possibilities, right? So um, if we think of, right, so here's our known. This represents our known reasons and, and the inconceivable ones. Um, I've done dotted lines to kind of suggest, gesture at their inconceivability, okay? They're, they're real, they just, we just can't come up with them. And then um, a, a dashed arrow that represents the resultant, okay? So right, if you have arrows going one, vectors going one direction and vectors in the other direction, then when you sum them, then it's the difference uh, of the two that, uh, that gives you your resultant. Okay, so four basic possibilities. Um, this this result this uh, inconceivable resultant, when compared to the conceivable resultant, this inconceivable resultant, it could be leftward pointing like this one in the illustration could be left pointing, and it could be it could be longer than the conceivable resultant, right? The resultant of all the reasons we can conceive of uh, for not allowing this thing. It could be leftward pointing and shorter. <coughs> That's what's illustrated here, leftward pointing and shorter. It could be rightward pointing and longer. It could be rightward pointing and shorter. Okay, so four different, four basic possibilities. Okay, so here's, um, so see, see, if, see if you're tracking. Um, in which of these possibilities, A, B, C, or D, in which of these possibilities would the Lisbon earthquake be justified? In which possibility would God be justified in allowing the Lisbon earthquake, okay? C, right, okay. So it's if it were rightward pointing and longer, okay, if, if you stack up all the inconceivable reasons for and reasons against, if you stack them all up, then their resultant is in the good direction and it's longer than the arrow in this direction, yes. Yeah, be be because it's a lot to juggle, right? Okay. Yes, but um, like if you really wanted to, I mean, yeah, if you really want to settle the question, you're going to have to bundle together all the evils. That's what you're thinking, right? You got to bundle together all the evils and this whole mass of evil, what could justify that, right? Yeah, you, you will have to do that. So we're, we're kind of focusing in on one just to make it conceptually easier, but then the hope is then to transfer the way that we're thinking to the, the bigger picture. Yes? So I'm a little bit confused about um, the inconceivable yep. uh, reasons why God might not do the good. Yep. In kind of the way you laid it out as the vector, you're implicitly assuming that by God not creating the good, he's actively doing bad. But that mm -hmm. seems like that's not really necessarily true. So why do we assume that those arrows point this way? We could assume that just by God not being, he may have a lot of inconceivable yeah. reasons for us to not do the good, but that doesn't mean that that's creating bad by not creating bad. Yeah, good. yeah, okay. Um, yeah, you're getting it. You're getting at something important. I'll say that. You're getting at something important, uh, and that is uh, what we might call a problem of dirty hands, right? So is it, uh, is it just that God is allowing or not allowing, or is it that God is actually doing, right? So there's a doing and allowing distinction in ethics, and it applies here. It applies here too. Um, but like to, to make it, to be as generous as possible to the, to the theist for the moment, just say God is not doing it. God's just allowing it, right? God's just allowing those things. So we're not thinking of God as dirtying his hands with any of this. Um, even so, even so, even if you're just allowing something, you, you still shouldn't allow it, not just not do it, but you still shouldn't allow it if you can prevent it and it's not worth it. It's not worth allowing. It, maybe it does some good things, but it doesn't do enough good. So don't even allow it in that case, right? Okay, so, um, okay, yeah, so there's only one, one case here. It's, it's only case C in which we get the result that the skeptical theist is looking for, namely that this comes out, this comes out justified. Um, all right, well, um, Tully suggests, Tully suggests that we, we can think of some of these things as on a par with each other, right? So we can think of, we can think of left pointing and longer as kind of on a par with, uh, with right pointing and longer, 
okay? These are, um, if we had to guess, we would say these are like equally probable. And then that, that the resultant ends up left pointing and shorter is about as probable as it ending up right pointing and shorter. Now, uh, if you wanted to like really try to sort out the probabilities, it, it would be incredibly complicated. And if you sorted it out, then you could, pub you could publish a book on that um, very easily because yeah, it's a, it's a very large task. Um, but if you have, if you haven't done the, if you haven't done that, then probably the best, uh, probably the best way to think of it is to set them equal to each other. Assume that, that probably these two are on a par uh, because you're, in a way, you're kind of partitioning the the space here, right, into, um, into four four uh, four bases. Yes, so, so four subspaces, and this space seems to be on a par with this space, and this. This space out here seems to be on a par with this space. Okay, so if you set them equal to each other, you, you end up with a situation like this where, okay, if we assume probability of A is equal to probability of C, and probability of B is equal to probability of D. Okay, so if we assume, if we assume that uh, for the sake of argument, uh, we also know that these have all got to be They've all got a sum to very close to 100%. Uh, like the only thing that they leave out, of course, is that uh, the resultants are exactly equal to each other. Okay? Um, and it, that could happen. It could turn out that way, that once you look at all the inconceivable reasons and you get the resultant, that it's exactly the length of the, the known resultant. That could happen. but. Uh, Perhaps very improbable, but in, or at least for simplification, we'll assume it's improbable. So these all equal or about equal to, to one, right? So if you if you do the if you do the algebra, um, you realize that um, the probability of C, okay, um, probability of C plus the probability of either of these. B is equal to 1 half 0.5, and therefore C has to have a probability less than or equal to 0.5. Okay, the most that this can be, the most that this could possibly be is 1 half. Okay, um, and, and quite likely less, because, um, because this seems possible as well, that, that you end up with an arrow that is not longer uh, a resultant that's not longer than the known resultant, right? I'll, I'll, I'll get you in just a second. I want to just kind of finish the thought here. Um, okay, so so here's here's uh, here's the upshot of all this. Okay, um, now we've got two arguments here, right? We've got um, an argument from evil, an argument from fine tuning, and. Um, if you if if someone like Bowden really pushes really pushes the parallels between the two, what they're going to what they're going to end up saying is, all right, um, yeah, there's a possibility. There's a possibility C. There is a possibility C, where um, there are unconceived, perhaps inconceivable goods that fully justify uh, fully justify God allowing the, this horrible evil. That is possible, but it's at best it's 0.5, and probably it's less. Probably it's less than that. So we need to have we need to have this bar down here. So this portion of our space is going to be down here, and therefore the 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 God exists portion of the Bayes box is uh, is just this right down here. Whereas on this side, probability that evil exists given not God exists, that may be quite a bit higher, and therefore we can still get, uh, we can still get a, 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 a fairly powerful argument from evil against God's existence, because this can be high and this has to be low. Okay. Um, on this side, though, I mean, if we use the same line of reasoning, yes, it may be possible that there are compelling reasons for God not to create this fine-tuned universe. Uh, we can't con conceive of those reasons, but there could well be, right? That's something analogous to this possibility C. It's a, uh, a right-pointing and longer uh, resultant. 
Okay, so we need to allow a gap up here and not say certainly God would do this. Um, there, there may be compelling reasons we can't think of for God not to. So the probability of fine-tuning given God, it should be maybe up here. Um, and without a, a, an argument to, to, uh, to the contrary, we should probably assume that this gap here is roughly the same as this gap here, right? That the space of unconceived, compelling reasons for God not to create a fine-tuned universe, even though we can, we can see what a wonderful, great thing that it is and worthy of God to do, um, that's about as likely as there being unconceived reasons for God to allow a horrendous evil like the Lisbon earthquake. Okay, so these may be on a par. Now, this would be, this would be, uh, this would, would just further establish Bowdoin's principle, his premise, that these arguments are just on a par with each other and that, uh, uh, that this defeats, that either it defeats natural theology or it doesn't defeat either one, we still have a perfectly good argument from evil against God's existence, except for one thing, okay? And if you look at your handout, you'll see we haven't filled in the right-hand side over here. We haven't filled in the right-hand side. And here's where the fine-tuning argument gets its bite. The way the fine-tuning argument is usually put is that it would not just be somewhat improbable for all the constants to have the values that they need to have in order for there to be an interesting universe with complex creatures. It's not just somewhat improbable, it is massively improbable. Uh, the figures that are thrown out uh, when, when, when we do kind of back of the napkin calculations, the figures that are thrown out are something like um, <clears throat> 1 over 10 to the 120th, right? That's, that would be a, a very much in keeping with the, 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 the sort of arguments that are given here. That this bar down here, this bar down here is, it's right at the bottom. There's, there's no breathing room down here, okay? And if that's the case, then even if you allow this gap, right, even if for reasons uh, uh, that are in keeping with skeptical theism, even if you allow this gap, you still get a really powerful fine-tuning argument. Now, again, assuming, right, that we're right that it's really massively improbable to get fine-tuning without God's existence. Whether that is true is a, another whole discussion, right, which maybe you've had in other sessions. Okay, that, that's, a, that's a further premise. But if, that, if you leave that a premise alone, just the logic of the argument is such that you, you can still, in, in principle, get a very powerful fine-tuning argument. Do you get an equally powerful argument against God's existence from evil? You would, you would, if this bar were up here. You would if this bar were up here. If, and what would that mean? That would mean if it's the case that given that God doesn't exist, things like the Lisbon earthquake would certainly happen or almost certainly happen. They would be almost bound to happen. But are they? If God didn't exist, what would the universe be like? There's all manner of possibilities, some of them extremely boring. Okay? You could have a complex universe, maybe, without God's existence, or you could have a very dull very simple universe with maybe just, you know, one particle um, or maybe nothing at all, maybe just an empty space. We can imagine all kinds of possible things that, uh, that are not ruled out, uh, that the, the space of possible universes is, it doesn't get constrained if God doesn't exist. There's all manner of possibilities, many of them very, very uninteresting, many of them including nothing like an earthquake. And nothing like no, uh, many of them, and may, maybe many of them are very interesting, but they have no creatures in them. And may, many, maybe many of them have creatures, but they have no sentient creatures, creatures that can feel, creatures that can suffer. So if God doesn't exist, there are many, many ways for there to be no suffering at all, even if God doesn't exist. So this bar is not up here. It's probably not even here, but at you know, but but may, you know, maybe it's maybe it's reasonably probable. But it's by no means certain that there would be suffering if God didn't exist. So this, this actually breaks the parity between the two arguments. At least it could, right? Again, I said there's another whole conversation about this premise. But at least you can see that the, the, the parity can get broken between these two kinds of arguments. You can, have, you can have your skeptical theism, 
it has to be moderated, right? It has to be moderated to some extent. You have to allow that there could still be an argument um, against God's existence from things like evil, but you don't have to allow that it's on a par with your arguments for God's existence. You could say that some of them are more powerful than others. Thank you very much. We're right at 930, but we can entertain one question. Oh, yes, Tanner. So, does there not have to be fine tuning? Is there like tuning evil? So that a little evil without God is just going to be like a subset of like fighting creation universes without God or something like that? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so the question is. Um, is, isn't there an interaction between these two considerations, namely that in order to have evil at all, you've got to have a fine-tuned universe. If you don't, even, if you don't have a fine-tuned universe, you don't have the sorts of creatures that could, that could suffer. Uh, and, yeah, so um, my, my uh, initial inclination is to say uh, it, at least with universes with physical creatures, I think that's true. Um, now, can there be a universe where there are uh, there are non-physical creatures that are suffering. And does that have to be? It doesn't have. It, maybe there's a fine-tuning argument there that uh, yeah, that there are like angelic beings that are capable of suffering of some sort, uh, not physical suffering, but some sort of suffering. Uh, so yeah, so you might be able to you might be able to argue there's there's um, there's at least that much of a gap. You could have evil without fine-tuning. Uh, but I think this is a very, uh, I think it's a very interesting line of thought, one that's that's well worth considering. And if it's successful, if that argument's successful, this is actually going to um, drag this bar way, way down, um, maybe almost all the way to the bottom. So that actually, interestingly, the argument from evil, but actually becomes an argument for God's existence, rather than again, you see what would happen, right? If this, right, if this bar um, gets moved all the way down to the bottom. Okay. Because the probability of evil, given not God exists, if it only happens in fine-tuned universes, and those are very, very rare without God's existence, then, then you, actually get, you actually get that this portion of the figure is the larger portion. The God portion is, is, is larger, and then you, then you get an argument for God's existence from evil. I find that a, a fascinating possibility. Um, I, and I'll, I'll, I'll stop with that uh, because I don't have, I don't think I have a compelling, um, yeah, a, yeah I, I, I don't have a paper on that one. Um, so once Tanner writes his paper on it, uh, then, yeah, uh, this, yeah then we, can, we can read it and learn from it. But, yeah, thank you all very much. Thanks for entertaining. And I, and I can stick around for a few minutes. I know a few other people had questions, but I can stick around for a few minutes and entertain other questions yeah, and more in, informally. Yeah, and per usual, we'll be going out and around the corner to uh, the Chick-fil-A. Sounds good. Okay, thanks again, guys.